Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, who is in charge? Pressure rises as some board members of WeWork reportedly consider ousting the CEO after the company's delayed IPO. We'll discuss the latest. Plus, snap to attention. The social media giant is set to be helping the Federal Trade Commission in its antitrust probe of Facebook. And will IAC spin off Vimeo to become a publicly traded company? We'll hear from the video platform CEO on the company's content strategy, as well as a new hiring feature. But first, our top story. More worries for WeWork. Pressure is mounting for the board to oust CEO Adam Newman after the startup delayed its IPO. But the question of when that could happen remains up in the air. The office sharing company's board was supposed to meet today, but now they are likely to convene later this week. Bloomberg Technology reporter Ellen Hewitt covers startups. She joins me now with the latest. Ellen, why the shakeup? Why the change? There's just been an insane week of news for WeWork in the last week or two. A lot of increasing pressure both first to delay the IPO, which they did last week, and now it seems like there are reports um, to consider replacing the CEO, Adam Newman. So we've just been seeing a lot of drama and a lot of back and forth within the board at this company, and some of the potential outcomes include maybe replacing the CEO, maybe delaying the IPO until October or even later, um, and we've just sort of been watching as it unfolds, as you said, possible board meeting this week, not expected to happen today, but likely to happen very soon. Ellen, who wants Adam Newman out? That's most likely SoftBank, according to our reporting, and they hold two board seats at WeWork. They're their biggest investor. They have invested more than $10 billion into the company. And it seems like they also have support from Benchmark, which has one board seat, had been an early investor in WeWork, and as some viewers may remember, was also instrumental in the boardroom shakeup and ousting of Travis Kalanick from Uber. Granted, that was a different partner from Benchmark. That was Bill Gurley, whereas here the board partner is Bruce Dunn. Levy, but it nevertheless remains. It seems like at least SoftBank and Benchmark are in favor of trying to get Adam Newman to at least step down as CEO. Ellen, how nervous should WeWork be that SoftBank's support of them now is starting to look like it's wavering a little bit? It's certainly an about face. SoftBank has been a staunch supporter of WeWork for the last few years. They first invested in 2017 and have been the only investor since then. So they have been pouring tons of money into this company publicly. Their chairman, Masayoshi Son, has shown a lot of public support for Adam. They've actually often been portrayed in the media as two kindred spirits, people who really embrace bold action and pursuing a growth at the, uh, at the expense of spending a lot of money. So it seemed like they had been aligned on the incentives and purposes and goals of the company and now it seems like that support is shifting so that's certainly surprising if you're someone who's been following the company for the last few years. Ellen we thought we'd get that board meeting today on Monday we didn't any ideas on what we can expect this week. I think the situation is pretty fluid. We are been trying to report the latest developments. Um, it just seems like there's a lot that's been happening, a lot that's in motion. We'll be looking for this meeting. I don't anticipate that it's going to be decided in one day. I mean, this is a huge change for the company. This is a CEO who's been a co-founder since the very beginning and someone whose spirit really infuses the company with his ideas, his vision, his personality. It's, again, similar to Uber, very hard to separate the culture of the the company from the personality of its CEO and changing anything about his position would be a huge shakeup at the company. So I don't think it's going to be a decision that's going to be taken lightly. The saga continues. Thank you to Bloomberg's Ellen Hewitt. And for more analysis, I want to bring in Gene Munster, co-founder and managing partner at Loop Ventures. He joins me from Minneapolis and Abby Adlerman, CEO of Boardspan, joining me here in San Francisco. So Abby, how concerned are you now? What does this board shift mean for you? Yeah, so I think Ellen hit on a lot of the high points, but the real issue for the public investors is going to go back to the two things that we've been talking about the whole way through. 
the governance side as well as the business fundamentals. And when you've got a CEO in play like this, you have to question which of those are being driven the most by that. What it really tells us, though, is the governance house is still very much not yet in order, and the board is trying to work through that. Gene, give me your thoughts on a potential board shakeup. Is that enough to squash some of the investor concerns? No, uh, uh, far from it, Taylor. I think that this is probably going to take a good year or so to sort itself out. That may uh, sound like it's slightly out of touch with reality, but I think the setup, Ellen, setup piece uh, really captured when she talked about the culture and the infusion uh, with Adam's views in the culture of the company. And uh, I do not think he will survive as CEO. I think he will be some sort of executive chairman but ultimately is uh, uh, getting uh, an organization like this in high growth mode, this is a 100% growing organization, to uh, align with uh, some more scrupulous public investors uh, is a most difficult uh, agenda. And so ultimately I think that this is gonna take a lot of time and um, I think there's gonna be some changes in terms of how uh, private, late stage private investing uh, is done because of the result of this. Gene, what is it about Adam Newman? Is it the spending more than the income? Is it his quirkiness? Is it his management style? What is it about him that investors are so concerned about? I mean, simply, it's uh, he is perceived as being reckless. And I think that when you uh, look at the evolution of companies, there is a period where a reckless CEO is most appropriate and just to change the world, that type of uh, uh, outside of the box thinking. Uh, but I think that the recklessness, and there's several factors that we've talked about here that play into it. Uh, as we've talked about, the list is long, and ultimately, I think that it uh, creates some anxiety around investors about what, uh, what is gonna happen uh, it really is uh, an open-ended question uh, when you hear stories about uh, this frat uh, party type of uh, a culture and uh, that just uh, that recklessness does not sit well with public investors. Abby, explain for us the role of the board. We know Corporate Governance 101, it's to hold the CEO accountable. Is the board holding the CEO accountable? Well, that's right, Taylor, and I think it goes beyond just holding the CEO accountable. You know, the first rule of governance is what's called the business judgment rule, which means that the board members have to act in the interest of the overall corporation. Um, in that case, they've got a duty of loyalty and a duty of care, and when they look at the role of the CEO, they have to ask themselves, is the CEO the right person to lead the organization? A lot of questions that are coming up, though, and it's related to what Jean just said, is, why are we facing this issue now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is this not something that was known to this board and this team and to the private investors? But we did know about it in the case of Facebook. We know Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk at Tesla. We have had these tech companies where you have these visionary leaders and you and I have spoken about this. Why now? Why the focus on Adam Newman and WeWork when Zuckerberg got away with it? I think what we're seeing is, is the private markets have pushed and pushed and pushed and we found that breaking point. You know, I think the outrage, for lack of a better word, when this IPO got filed, uh, really sort of drew the line. Now, people can talk about the public market environment we're in, they can talk about other public role models, but I just think it got pushed one step too far. Gene, talk to me about this idea of tech companies where you have a Mark Zuckerberg who's okay. Those shareholders and those boards are okay with Mark running the company, I guess, because it's profitable. Why is there now this concern over Adam Newman at WeWork? Is it because the company isn't profitable? No, I think that there's, it's a spectrum, of course, and exceptions to the rule, Elon Musk is going to be one, but I think the, the line is generally drawn somewhere around, uh, I refer to as recklessness in the past, but somewhere uh, uh, drug usage, which is uh, common uh, in the tech community. Uh, I think that there is a level of awareness of that that, that uh, gets public investors more concerned. I think a culture where women are not as respected like they should be, that's obviously a point of concern too. 
And uh, I know it's easy to say negative things in an environment like this, so I want to be judicious in the things I'm pointing out. But I think the simple takeaway is if you look at somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, even though he had a uh, uh, break things type of a mentality that he built in the culture of Facebook, I think the, those two former pieces, uh, he was uh, measured and uh, respected, and I think that that uh, is why the, the difference is. I do, just in the brief time that we have, I want to just quickly, Taylor, mention, I think that there's going to be some changes from this. And ultimately, I think this concept of super voting rights, which has been beneficial to some tech companies, Mark Zuckerberg included, uh, will probably go away over time. I mean, this tech companies now have not only uh, power around politics and, and media and the economy, and I think this is a, a perfect example of why 20 to 1 voting rights just isn't appropriate. Abby, you're nodding your head. Weigh in. Yeah, no, I think Gene's comments are spot on. And I think in addition to things like super voting rights and what comes out in the public market, we're going to see a lot of changes in the private market. I mean, it sort of maybe hasn't, uh, hasn't surprised people that the litany of CEOs you're talking about are sort of the bad boys of Silicon Valley. Well, bad boys need good parents. And this is where the board has to come in and be two steps ahead of them. Gene, let me get some comments from you now just on the basic fundamentals. How does a 10 to $15 billion valuation feel to you? Is it fair value? Uh, I was uh, 10 to 15. I think that's the right range. I, I would, as if I put a public investing perspective on this, given the cash burn, given the revenue growth, as we talked about, most impressive, I think probably closer to 10. I know that some of the language has been changed in the S1 about some sort of attractive profitability. So that probably favors uh, kind of the, the low end of that. Uh, the challenge when you think about the valuation with this is that there's really no good uh, comp. Uh, this is a tech company in quotes, but a real estate company in practice. And so uh, difficult to, to, and they're changing the world. This is a whole new uh, category they've created. And so um, I would think that that feels, uh, that, that feels uh, in that range closer to 10 than 15. And Gene, if they don't do an IPO this year, how does their balance sheet look? Well, it starts to get stressed uh, sometime next year, and that's why I ultimately think that Adam is going to be moved to more of an executive chairman role because SoftBank is the key factor. Uh, you've talked about it in the segment here earlier, but uh, the balance sheet needs work and uh, will need some, some help. Uh, close to a billion dollars, kind of 700 million seems to be the number, uh, to what I think will probably get them to a more appropriate IPO. Gene, it's interesting when we talk about equity analysis and we fold that into bond analysis. If you come quickly and look at a chart here that I'm showing our Bloomberg audience here in the terminal, it's that the bondholders, frankly, have held in there pretty well, 97 cents on the dollar. I believe I was reading that there might be a clause that if there's a management change, bondholders would have to get bought out at 101 cents on the dollar. Have you read that? What does that mean to you? News to me uh, that could impact some of the the forces at play here. Ultimately, I think if it's just a 101 percent uh, uh, kind of a premium, uh, I think that that is uh, doesn't change kind of how I feel ultimately that I think change at the top is needed here. And I think in, we will, in fact, get that. It's a roundtable Monday. Luke Ventures, co-founder Gene Munster in Minneapolis and Abby Adlerman, CEO of Boardspan here joining me in San Francisco. And coming up, Snap accuses Facebook of playing dirty. That's according to a new report that's out. We'll discuss the potential focus of Facebook's antitrust probe by the FTC next. This is Bloomberg. Gene, talk to me about this idea of tech companies where you have a Mark Zuckerberg who's okay. Those shareholders and those boards are okay with Mark running the company, I guess, because it's profitable. Why is there now this concern over Adam Newman at WeWork? Is it because the company isn't profitable? No, I think that there's it's a spectrum, of course, and exceptions to the rule. Elon Musk is going to be one. But I think the, the line is generally drawn somewhere around, uh, I refer to as recklessness in the past, but somewhere uh, uh, drug usage, which is uh, common uh, in the tech community. 
Uh, I think that there is a level of awareness of that that, that uh, gets public investors more concerned. I think a culture where women are not as respected like they should be, that's obviously a point of concern too. And uh, I know it's easy to say negative things in an environment like this, so I want to be judicious in the things I'm pointing out. But I think the simple takeaway is if you look at somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, even though he had a uh, uh, break things type of a mentality that he built in the culture of Facebook, I think the, those two former pieces, uh, he was uh, measured and uh, respected, and I think that that... Uh, is why the, the difference is. Uh, I do, just in the brief time that we have, I want to just quickly, Taylor, mention, I think that there's going to be some changes from this. And ultimately, I think this concept of super voting rights, which has been beneficial to some tech companies, Mark Zuckerberg included, uh, will probably go away over time. I mean, this tech companies now have not only uh, power around politics and, and media and the economy, and I think this is a, a perfect example of why 20 to 1 voting rights just isn't appropriate. Abby, you're nodding your head. Weigh in. Yeah, no, I think Gene's comments are spot on. And I think in addition to things like super voting rights and what comes out in the public market, we're going to see a lot of changes in the private market. I mean, it sort of maybe hasn't, uh, hasn't surprised people that the litany of CEOs you're talking about are sort of the bad boys of Silicon Valley. Well, bad boys need good parents. And this is where the board has to come in and be two steps ahead of them. Jean, let me get some comments from you now just on the basic fundamentals. How does a 10 to $15 billion valuation feel to you? Is it fair value? Uh, I was uh, 10 to 15. I think that's the right range. I, I would, as if I put a public investing perspective on this, given the cash burn, given the revenue growth, as we talked about, most impressive, I think probably closer to 10. I know that some of the language has been changed in the S1 about some sort of attractive profitability. So that probably favors uh, kind of the, the low end of that. Uh, the challenge when you think about the valuation with this is that there's really no good uh, comp. Uh, this is a tech company in quotes, but a real estate company in practice. And so uh, difficult to, to, and they're changing the world. This is a whole new uh, category they've created. And so um, I would think that that feels, uh, that, that feels uh, in that range closer to 10 than 15. And Gene, if they don't do an IPO this year, how does their balance sheet look? Well, it starts to get stressed uh, sometime next year, and that's why I ultimately think that Adam is going to be moved to more of an executive chairman role because SoftBank is the key factor. Uh, you've talked about it in the segment here earlier, but uh, the balance sheet needs work, and uh, we'll need some, some help. Uh, close to a billion dollars, kind of 700 million seems to be the number, uh, to what I think will probably get them to a more appropriate IPO. Gene, it's interesting when we talk about equity analysis and we fold that into bond analysis. If you come quickly and look at a chart here that I'm showing our Bloomberg audience here in the terminal, it's that the bondholders, frankly, have held in there pretty well, 97 cents on the dollar. I believe I was reading that there might be a clause that if there's a management change, bondholders would have to get bought out at 101 cents on the dollar. Have you read that? What does that mean to you? News to me uh, that could impact some of the the forces at play here. Ultimately, I think if it's just a 101 uh, percent uh, kind of a premium, uh, I think that that is uh, doesn't change kind of how I feel ultimately that I think change at the top is needed here. And I think in, we will, in fact, get that. It's a roundtable Monday. Luke Venture is co-founder Gene Munster in Minneapolis and Abby Adlerman, CEO of Boardspan here, joining me in San Francisco. And coming up, Snap accuses Facebook of playing dirty. That's according to a new report that's out. We'll discuss the potential focus of Facebook's antitrust probe by the FTC next. This is Bloomberg. Federal prosecutors are conducting a criminal probe of e-cigarette maker Juul. That's according to a report by Dow Jones citing people familiar with the matter. The investigation is being led by the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District of California. The Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, and several state attorneys general are investigating Juul for its marketing practices. The Trump administration said earlier this month that it planned to ban most flavored e-cigarettes. A Juul spokesman had no immediate comment, but has denied it markets to teens.
And a social media company, Snap, is reportedly talking to federal regulators about the ways Facebook allegedly tried to thwart competition. Dow Jones reports that Snap's legal team had been keeping a dossier named Project Voldemort on Facebook's anti-competitive tactics. Those tactics include discouraging popular account holders from referencing Snap. For insight into how this might be affecting the rivals, I want to bring in Pivotal Research Senior Analyst Michael Levine, who joins me from New York. Michael, what is your initial take on this report about Snap on Facebook? I mean, my reaction to it is they're probably one of a laundry list of companies that the FTC at this point is probably currently reaching out to to try to go ahead, have a better understanding of are they acting as a monopolist? And uh, I mean, look, if you if you look back over the evolution of Snap over the last couple years, Facebook certainly had a pretty negative impact with regards to emulating what they had done with stories. So there's probably a little bit of an ax to grind already at baseline, but it's, it's consistent with what we've been hearing. We've been hearing it from large advertisers as well that the FTC has been reaching out over the last couple of weeks. You know, you cover Facebook as well as Snap, and I wonder how much of this is normal cost of doing business and how much of this was Facebook really overstepping the bounds? You know, it's, it's hard to say. I, I you know, I've, I've got some pretty firm opinions looking at the big names that I think are at this point under the, you know, under the, the scrutiny of the government. Um, I think in a lot of cases that when I, when I look through what Facebook has done, um, definitely a lot of what they were doing with Cambridge Analytica, I feel like was a little bit aggressive last year. I think they're just a very, very tough competitor. Um, I, I think that they have definitely emulated competitors in the past. They've definitely done so with Snap. Um, I, I think that the tactics that you were highlighting about going ahead and trying to punish influencers if they're referencing Snap feels a little bit close to the line, but I mean, I don't know if that in itself makes Facebook a monopolist. Depending on how these conversations go between Facebook competitors and regulators, what is the real threat that Facebook could be broken up? I, look, it's it's something you have to you have to respect, and in, in my opinion, I think you're seeing that in Facebook stock, in Google stock, and Amazon stock, as investors don't really know quite how to handicap it. I mean, if I if I really were to roll things forward by a few years, let's say for example, Instagram was broken off from Facebook, my sense is you probably would have ultimate value creation since I suspect that the you know the the Instagram assets growing at a much faster rate than core Facebook is at this point um, Facebook would probably be showing much better margins at the core you'd have some necessity to go ahead and uh, reduplicate some of the targeting infrastructure and sales but ultimately I don't I don't think it would be a game changer in terms of just like being company ending um, you know would it be disruptive certainly so from what I heard, the market's accurately priced it in, let's call it a conglomerate discount to Facebook. I, you know, it's, it's a hard thing when it comes to some of the parts analyses to say that, the, you know, that this is the right multiple and it's appropriately discounting it. But, you know, one of the examples I would point to out of earnings that I thought was probably the biggest surprise of, you know, call it the three names in my coverage of Amazon, Google, and Facebook that are currently being investigated by the government is, is basically Google, where you had numbers went up by 11%, the stock went up 9% after earnings and is basically down a couple percent since then. So I think what at least you're seeing in terms of the reactions to, to earnings and how the stocks are trading right now is reflecting some degree of a government overhang. Um, is that mean it should be a two-turn discount than, you know, than what investors think it should be worth? It's hard to say. It's, it's a bit of an art form when it comes to multiples, but I, I've definitely talked to a lot of frustrated Google and Facebook bulls who I think uh, you know, have conceivably loftier expectations about where the multiples could go in the short term. Um, we're, is, we've been a little more cautious. Is the only way to get ahead of this from the tech company's perspective to self-regulate? I think it's a little bit harder for the government to go ahead, come through with the nuances of what you're actually able to do with regards to, to advertising. Um, there have been there have been attempts prior over the years. I, I think it's I think the nuances get pretty granular and it's a little bit challenging to go ahead and, and figure out. We, we've certainly been a little bit more negative with regards to Google where we think that things like the uh, the Play Store and in, in the Apple case, iTunes, to me are much more 
quantifiable. Government could come in and say, look, we don't think 30% is a fair take rate. 15% feels like a more appropriate cost of doing business. Um, you know, that goes above and beyond just a fine. So what that's my suspicion. What tech companies do you like that don't have that regulatory overhang? Uh, look, we're, we're huge fans of Snap. We're huge fans of Twitter, uh, both of which I think are going ahead, executing fabulously. I think that Twitter, let's take that for, uh, you know, for the first example, I think is a name I'm, I'm hearing more and more from investors. They want to own into the election year. They've got a, a sizable presence in Japan, um, so they should benefit pretty meaningfully from the Olympics. And just coming back from, uh, from actually meeting earlier today with Snap, I, I think their execution at this point is, is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, there's really been a, a massive turnaround at the senior ranks. User growth is rebounding. We think trends are looking strong for this quarter through the end of the year. Well, racing from his meeting with Snap to Bloomberg TV, thank you. That was Michael Levine of Pivotal Research. And coming up, Life on the Road show. Peloton highlights hotel partnerships to potential investors during its roadshow on Monday. More on what to expect ahead of the company's IPO next. This is Bloomberg. Google is bracing for another landmark privacy decision from the EU. Courts may clarify scope of the right to be forgotten law that passed five years ago. The law forces the tech company to delete links to personal information on request. The court is questioning if the rights should apply globally. A decision could be reached as early as Tuesday. Still with Google and company workers will again listen to audio snippets of people speaking to its digital voice assistant to help improve the product's quality if users give the company permission to do so. Google paused all human review of assistant audio in July. Under the new policy, the company will tell users that their audio may be listened to if they have an opt-in to feature that, and it also improves audio quality. And executives at Peloton hope hotels will propel investor demand during the company's Roadshow Monday. CEO John Foley helped highlight the company's bike and treadmill at a luxury hotel in New York. There, he told potential investors that subscribers will want to continue their Peloton regimens while traveling. At the end of June, Peloton had bikes in 700 hotels. The company wants to raise about $1.2 billion in its IPO. The share sale is set to price Wednesday with trading debut Thursday. And coming up, Apple is making a supply chain shift amid the U.S.-China trade fight. We find out what they are building, where and why next. And Roku shares in focus. A streaming competition heats up. We dig into the company's fundamentals. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology, I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Now to the latest on trade and tariffs. Apple says the next version of its high-end Mac Pro desktop will be assembled in Texas after the company received tariff waivers on key components. The company on Friday was granted exclusions by the Trump administration on several parts, including processors, power components, and the computer's casing. The new Pro will include components made by more than 12 U.S. companies. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Gurman in Los Angeles. Mark, is this part of a broader trade deal? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's very possible they sort of can use, you know, this idea that they're going to be manufacturing this computer, which, by the way, they've been doing so for the previous model for six years in Texas, as a way to maybe influence the Trump administration to go a little bit easier on them come December 15th when the iPhone, the iPad, laptops, and other more important products are due to be hit with tariffs. So, Mark, you brought up December 15th. We know that the Mac Pro is made in the U.S. Why can't they make all of those other products that are facing future tariffs to avoid those tariffs, too? 
Yeah, so to be clear on the Mac Pro, it's not completely made in the US, right? So primarily the casing and other very important components are, are made in China, they're produced and manufactured there. Then they're exporting them to the US for what is known as final assembly. Whereas in China, that's the iPhone is primarily made there, a lot of the components as well as the phone's actual uh, production. Now why can't they make the iPhone, the iPad and those other products here? Well, they're actually way more complex than the Mac Pro. The Mac Pro is basically, for all intents and purposes, a mishmash of components that are much easier to, to assemble than something as intricate and as small as a mobile device. Mark, do you have any sense of Tim Cook's conversations with the president? How did this come about? Yeah, I mean, Apple has been lobbying uh, the, the Trump administration for relief on tariffs now for, for over a year. They started by really lobbying against publicly, I should say, the Apple Watch and AirPods tariffs last year. They got a, a brief waiver on that. They saved some money there. Uh, but, you know, Trump has, has notably been meeting uh, with Tim Cook. There have been dinners. There have been White House meetings, Oval Office meetings. Uh, there was a famous photo of Tim Cook uh, along with President Trump and, and John Bolton at the time. It, in the Oval Office from a few months ago. So clearly he's been working behind the scenes uh, to make sure Apple's business is as safe as possible uh, from the impact that these tariffs will have on, on many American companies. Mark, I have to note that the Mac Pro being mostly, as you mentioned too, assembled in the US, a win for Apple, a win for consumers. You wonder if this also sort of feels like a win for Trump too. I mean, 12 US companies will be participating in this, made in Texas. How important is it that 12 of those companies are US companies? I mean, this is this is all PR, right? This is this is not a, a big change in, in their strategy. The previous model was manufactured in the U.S., and the Trump administration will very likely flaunt this. Uh, you saw how Trump was talking about how Apple has been building big, beautiful plants, as he called them in the U.S., whether or not that was actually true, and, and really making a, a point to emphasize that it has Apple on his side, going as far to call Tim Cook one of his good friends. So. From a strategic standpoint, I'm not sure much has changed for Apple here. For Trump, it's definitely a PR win. Another day, another Apple product, another tariff. Thank you. That was Bloomberg Technology reporter Mark Gurman. Now, since the streaming wars have begun and big companies have gone into the game, it has been bad news for Roku. Cheaper services like Apple TV Plus, they are making investors worried about how Roku will be able to compete. But are investors overreacting? I ask Rosenblatt Securities Analyst Mark Skokovic on the phone from Minneapolis and Wu Jin Ho of Bloomberg Intelligence in Princeton. So, Mark, let me start with you. Is the market overreacting? Well, Thanks, Schiller, uh, for the question. Uh, you know, I'd say, first off, uh, I think more recently the market's been uh, reacting to Comcast and a streaming box that they're uh, essentially offering for free. Uh, they're new to the market. They came in with a streaming box back in March. Uh, they're now going to offer the box for free. Um, and I think there's a, been a pretty significant overreaction to um, that announcement, just given uh, Roku's really leadership uh, lead here, if you will, in uh, – just streaming devices. We estimate they have roughly 35 percent penetration of U.S. broadband uh, households, and uh, we see that uh, reach continuing to uh, be extended, not only relative to Comcast, but also relative to uh, Amazon Fire devices. Wu Jin, let me pull you in here. Up until very recently, analysts appeared to be pretty bullish on the stock. What happened in the last week? Sure, and, and thanks, Taylor. I, th I think we should talk a little bit more about the last couple of weeks. Uh, if we think about the bullishness on the stock, it's uh, more along the lines of the international expansion opportunity, and I think there was a lot of talk about there. You know, prior to the uh, Apple TV Plus announcement, um, you know, the, the CEO of Roku was at the IFA disclosing what uh, uh, some of his near-term um, international uh, expansion strategy was, and that was a little bit underwhelming because they only announced one TV partner versus the six or seven that they have today, and then and then we started to steamroll with, you know, the uh, like Mark said, more on the the Comcast announcement with the free uh, uh, free device uh, offering uh, as well as uh, Facebook's uh, device offering uh, for the TV as well. Mark, how much of that international growth and international expansion can you factor into your long-term sales growth for Roku? 
Well, we have very modest expectations. I think uh, I, I sort of look at international as somewhat of a call option in the stock. Uh, for instance, if you look out to our uh, calendar 27 expectations, we have only about 40 million outside U.S. households as active accounts. So, um, you know, depending on how, you know, people are modeling the growth, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, there's still some room here in the stock as it relates to, uh, um, you know, international. So we sort of look at uh, international more as a call option uh, here. Mark, you were talking a lot about penetration rate. I wonder when we measure current demand, how elastic are customers? If you're a Roku customer, could you very easily switch or do you see demand really holding in there? Uh, well, I think it's very easy to switch, but I think, you know, habits are hard to break. So, you know, if you think about how Roku is being used today in the household, it's really as an aggregation device. So it's whether you're watching Apple TV, Netflix, uh, Hulu, what have you, uh, you're watching all of your TV programming from one device. So I, I think Roku does that very well. You're not paying for it uh, on a monthly basis. So I, I don't know that uh, switching costs necessarily um, are, are relevant, if you will, in the um, you know in Roku's marketplace today. If you think about Comcast and what they're attempting to do, you know they obviously own the broadband pipe, but they're late to the game here. You know you have Roku with roughly 35. You know, percent penetration. We estimate Amazon Fire devices have roughly 25 percent penetration of, of homes. So there's a big hill to climb, uh, and you're basically fighting against a, a brand that is sort of the household name in streaming. And Wu Jin, you started off our conversation talking about the last few weeks. I wonder how much of this was really the multiples and the price and the sentiment just getting ahead of itself a little bit. Sure, and um, you know, if you, if you think about valuation, uh, prior to the last couple of weeks, it was trading roughly around 11 to 12 times sales. And, and again, I do fall back to the international enthusiasm that that some of the sell side was trying to to push. Um, you know, where we are in the multiples, we're we're roughly about eight times uh, forward sales. And the way we're measuring um, the valuation right now is relative to the consumer facing uh, ad generating internet names. So you know. The, the value proposition for Roku long term is more on the the, the ad uh, revenue that it could generate off of uh, the video streaming uh, more so than any type of subscription fees. Thank you. That was Mark Skakovich of Rosenblatt Securities, Wu Jin Ho of Bloomberg Intelligence. You are going to be staying with me because I want to stick with streaming wars. Now, day after resigning from Apple's board, Disney CEO Bob Iger floated the idea of a merger between the two companies if Steve Jobs was still alive. That was from an excerpt in his upcoming memoir. For more on how these two went from friends to foes, is Bloomberg tech reporter Austin Carr. And from Princeton, still with me, it's Wu Jin Ho of Bloomberg Intelligence. We sort of set up this conversation for me by talking about where we are within the streaming wars. Who, according to your analysis, is poised to really benefit from this structural shift to streaming? Sure. Well, if, if you look at the um, uh, the streaming vendors right now, it's it's always been or has been this the standalone discrete streaming vendors. We started with uh, Netflix with uh, uh, going from. Uh, you know, just to uh, to an over-the-top model, and now we're starting to follow along uh, with uh, new players such as uh, Disney uh, coming out with their Disney Plus, as well as Apple TV Plus coming out in November. So, uh, you know, if you look at the top five uh, streaming platform players today, it's going to be Netflix, and then uh, we drop down to someone like a YouTube, then a Hulu, and then an HBO. But I do think that Disney and uh, and Apple will be very fast followers. So, Austin, let me bring you in there because you heard Hulu or Disney and Apple could have been, you know, sort of these these big powers at work. But I love the quote that you led off with in your story that really said it was so dependent on Steve Jobs being alive to get this done. Why was it so dependent on having Steve Jobs still in the picture? I think what Bob Iger was getting at in his excerpt was the cro close relationship that uh, these two had, uh, both when they were on each other's uh, boards. 
Um, Bob Iger uh, was close with uh, with Steve throughout the, the acquisition of Pixar. That was one thing. Uh, he's, of course, been close personally. Uh, in that excerpt, he also disclosed that uh, Steve Jobs was one of the first, uh, he was one of the first that Steve Jobs disclosed his cancer and health issues to more than shareholders and things of that nature. Um, so it was really fascinating. He, he really talked at that close relationship and how even more so than under Tim Cook, there was more likelihood that they would have merged together and created this sort of uh, um, really uh, unprecedented uh, partnership between the distribution side and the content side, which is really what Wu Jin was talking about. All these streaming wars that really come down to who owns the platform and who owns the content and which is more valuable. Well, in Austin, bringing this to present day, I wonder how likely would be a merger. You know, Apple, $200 billion in cash on the balance sheet. Why, what would a merger look like today? I, I think it'd be complicated, which is perhaps why there was a lot of hedging in that article about this is years in the past. This was sort of a hypothetical. And even if Steve Jobs was still around, it, it, it might have been something they pursued somewhat or considered somewhat seriously, but not necessarily something that would have happened. Uh, but the reason is, uh, the reason it's so intriguing, of course, is it goes back to that Apple TV Plus announcement. Uh, you might have remembered Oprah coming on stage and sort of famously saying, why do I partner with Apple? It's because they're in a billion pockets, y'all. Uh, and what she meant by that is they're, they have their iPhones, they have their uh, iPads, MacBooks, every sort of diff different device you can imagine, they are in the pockets of consumers. Uh, inversely, uh, they have no content. Uh, some share a st uh, a stock analysts have described their, their launch of TV Plus as building a house without furniture. In other words, they don't have that tremendous back catalog, uh, which is uh, of content and, and movies and TV shows, which is what they're really trying to build out and what Disney could have offered them when it came to an acquisition. Well, the streaming wars discussion continues. That was Bloomberg Tech reporter Austin Carr and Bloomberg Intelligence Wu Jin Ho. And coming up, we hear from the CEO Vimeo on why the company is staying out of the streaming space and the road to become public. This is Bloomberg. China e-commerce giant Alibaba is holding its annual investors conference in Hangzhou. It comes after the backdrop of a worsening outlook for China's economy. The government has also increased its scrutiny of China's sprawling private sector, and that includes Alibaba. Now, over the weekend, Hangzhou dispatched officials to Alibaba and other companies in a move that they say was to facilitate communication and expedite projects. Joining me on the phone from that investor meeting is RB. Capital Markets Analyst Zach Schwartzman. Start with me about what you want to hear from the company as it relates to their e-commerce platform. Yeah, great. So we actually did hear a lot about the e-commerce e platform uh, yesterday and some of the, the improvements they've made. We believe Alibaba has positioned itself well to weather this uh, long-term trade war that, or potential long-term trade war that you were just referencing with strategic investment uh, domestically to cater to this growing middle class. You know, Zach, it was really interesting. When you talk about tier three cities, 70%, at least from our estimates, of long-term growth is expected to come from some of those lower tier cities. We talk about some penetration rate. What do you need to see in terms of growth in some of those lower tier cities? Yeah, so it's, it's really with these strategic investments that Alibaba has made. They've gone through this investment cycle where EBITDA margins have come from 50% a few years ago down to 30% today. Some of those investments are in Tenyao, their logistics platform, which they spoke about in detail yesterday. Others in local consumer services, such as Elema, which is a food delivery. And they, had met, they gave an update that these are already in, in 70 of these cities with an additional uh, 60 here. And we think that this is sort of going to allow them to uh, gain uh, more market share of this $1.3 trillion opportunity over the next 10 years. You know, Zach, I love that you brought up food delivery. It's a pretty capital intensive business and competitive. What do you need to hear from the company about food delivery? Well, it's a, uh, it's, their main competitor out here is is uh, Meituan, uh, but what, what's interesting and what, what's unique about uh, uh, Elama versus some of the maybe food delivery in the U.S. is that Alipay is one of the largest payment platforms. So they already have a lot of the offline transaction data, so they can have great targeting uh, for 
for for new for new um, new people ordering and new consumers ordering food, and they can provide a lot of data, a rich data set to restaurants, sort of off the bat as they enter these cities, as they have the, uh, the prior purchase history. Zach, quickly here, as every internet giant, of course, goes to AI and cloud, can you further assume margin expansion with the shift to cloud? Well, cloud's still not profitable for Alibaba. Uh, we we think that uh, that may happen over the next couple of years, but most analysts aren't modeling that, at least not yet. But on a comprehensive basis, we are modeling uh, profit growth here over the next few years. We had 15% adjusted EBITDA growth last year. Because of these investments that they've made uh, over the past few years, we think that the profit growth will actually accelerate here from 20 to 29% mm -hmm. EBITDA growth in fiscal year yep. 20 and 33% next fiscal Thanks. year. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. From China, that was RBC Capital Markets analyst Zach Schwartzman on Alibaba. Now, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. This is Bloomberg.